Well, good morning. Oh, I'm so excited about this sermon. I cannot even tell you. Uh, I almost didn't go to sleep last night. Okay, that was a lie. I did go to sleep quite well last night, uh, but I'm still very excited about this. Uh, so uh, pray with me this morning. Uh, Jesus, your name is above all else. And we just... Oh, we just sit back in adoration and worship of just who you are and what you're desiring to do in our lives. God, I just pray that you would just move this morning. Would you speak through your word? Uh, would you just impress your heart and your mind upon ours? Uh, we're just uh, so thankful for what you're doing in us and through us. And we just passionately love you. In your precious name, amen. Ephesians chapter 1 this morning. Ephesians chapter 1. To give a quick review, we've been walking through Ephesians chapter 1, specifically this prayer section from verse 15 onward. And we've been walking through what all this, basically all the stuff that Paul is praying for those in Ephesus, which is the same prayer he's praying on our behalf. The last several times we've been together, we've been looking at specifically verses 19, 20, and 21. I want to read those this morning. Paul says, I pray that you would know... What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in that which is to come. Uh, we've looked at this idea that Paul is trying to describe the power of God. And how do you describe something which is absolutely impossible to describe? Paul goes, I cannot do it. He goes, I'm going to give it my very best attempt. I'm going to pull out two very rare Greek words to try to emphasize what I'm talking about when I'm referring to the exceeding greatness of God's power. So he uses the word exceeding greatness. Then he goes on and says, this this power of God that he has. Let me, let me explain it to you. And I, apparently I was told last night that it is a horribly silly illustration. But it's the illustration nonetheless. So, and, and just for note, uh, Randy, uh, it's not necessarily an illustration as a picture of the Greek text. <clears throat> silly or not, that's how it is. Just kidding. I love you. So Paul says this in verse 19. I pray that you would know the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. So what Paul is saying is that God has this overwhelming authority, dominion, control. He is absolutely, positively sovereign and in control of everything at all times, everywhere. Amen. And then he goes on to say that Paul has this overwhelming iscus. Can't even do it without laughing now. It says, wah! Okay, so God has this overwhelming, is this not, maybe this one, whoa, is that better? So God has this overwhelming strength and power and possibility. Now he's not exerting that power, but he has all that power, okay? Paul says he's taking that power and he's literally flowing it, which is another word for power, energy, into our lives, creating this, this dynamite explosion. So when you look at any Christian what should be going on in the Christian's life are these explosions of the dynamite of God's power. This is of just the movement of God in that individual's life. And what would it be like if a whole community of people were walking about in their culture, in their society, and all that you saw was this explosions of dynamite, this dunamis power in their life? Would you not sit back and go, holy stinking cow? i got to get on on that. In fact, that's what the New Testament church was doing. You, you had this whole group of people who had this, the vibrant life of God, the power of God flowing in their veins. They were marching out in the world, and you just started seeing these... And everyone's looking on going, what is going on? And in 70 years, they turned the world upside down. So you look at me and you say, oh, our culture is getting worse. Oh, there's so many problems. Oh, I'm just... Ah. Well, we need a movement of God in our day. 
that is similar, if not greater, than the First Testament hour, which I fully believe can happen. So here's God. He has this overwhelming ability. He's flowing it into our lives, creating this explosion in us. So, like anybody, you walk up to Paul and you say, Paul, that makes sense, but how, will, you, will, you describe, will you give me an illustration of what that looks like practically? Paul says, ah, I would love to. I will give you two of them. First, let me describe this power in light of Jesus, in the life of Jesus. And second, let me describe it in the life of you. So in verses 20 down through verse 23, Paul gives the illustration of the power of God that is flowing and moving Jesus. And in chapter 2, verses 1 down to verse 10, he gives this illustration of the power of God in your life and what it's accomplishing and producing, which is just overwhelmingly exciting. So we were looking at uh, verse 20 of chapter 1 the last several times. This idea that the power of God, this indescribable, overwhelming power of God, has only reached into death itself, grabbed Jesus, yanked him out of death, seated him in the right hand, in this place of dependency, in this place of intimacy, in this place of responding, in this place of power, in this place of control, in this place of authority, at the right hand of the Father. Not only that, it says that everything, and I mean everything, is under the feet of Jesus. And two weeks ago, we looked at this idea of his position is far above principality, power, might, and dominion. Meaning, if you want to look at that as the angelic spiritual realm, so be it. If you want to look at it in terms of Military strength, so be it. Either way, what it's saying is that our Jesus is far above all things. You cannot name a single thing that is far -er above Jesus. And two weeks ago, we took the illustration. If we had a sunflower seed, and the sunflower seed was the fullness, the culmination, the entirety of of all the demonic realm, of all the earth and world, of all the problems in your life, if you were to sum up all that stuff, it only amounts to a sunflower seed. Now, we look at our sunflower seed and we're like, look at the sunflower seed! But it's a sunflower seed. It's a stinking sunflower seed. Are you with me? That, hey, the pressures in our lives, the immensity of our temptations... Hey, the spiritual warfare that's going on in our life is nothing but a wink-a-dink sunflower seed. And we put it on the ground. And we said, our Jesus is far above. Which does not mean he's here. Which does not mean he's here. It does not even mean he is here. Sorry, Byron. Okay, our Jesus is not even here. Our Jesus is on the pinnacle of the redwood trees, which is like 375 feet tall. If you took 65 of me, stacked them on top of each other, this is almost two of me. So if you had 30 more of these stacked on top of each other, that's almost the height of a redwood tree. And our Jesus is still far above even that. And when you're looking at the top of a redwood tree, down at a little sunflower seed, can you even see the stinking seed? So why are we so obsessed over our pitiful, measly, little problems when we have a God who is far above? <clears throat> Which brings us to our passage this morning. With all that in our minds, Paul says, not only is he far above anything you can name, but in verse 21, in verse 21 he says, he's not only far above over principality, power, might, and dominion, but he's also far above every name that you can name. Every name that you can name, he still has a greater name. Stay with me because you'll be bouncing up and down in like 20 minutes here. This is so exciting. Our God does not merely have a, 
Oh, well, he has a good name. It's, it's Jesus. Makes you warm and fuzzy inside. No. His name is far above. Which means it's not just far above, but like far above. That's who our Jesus is. I want to walk through this thing with you. Stay seated. I know you're excited. Names throughout the Bible mean something. You probably know this. When you're in the Old Testament, if you were given a name, it wasn't like, hey, we're just going to call you Sally, or hey, we're going to call you Bob, though they may be good names. In the Old Testament, when you were given a name, it was to define who you were. It defined your nature, it defined your character, it defined your attitude. All that you are was summed up in your name. For example, here's this mother. She's pregnant. Oh. And she's about to give birth. And as she's in labor, she has twins, she finds out. The first one comes out. And it says he was a little reddish, meaning he probably had some red hair. But he was a furball. That's what the passage says. Uh, in fact, it said that uh, he was like a hairy garment. That's what I thought. Uh, in those days, you know, garments were made out of animal skins or stuff. Could you imagine giving birth to a baby? You look down and you're like, what is that? And obviously, this is her firstborn, and, you know, you've never done this before. And, you know, as a firstborn, you're the, you're the standard of everything else. And you're looking at the little thing, and you're like, what did I create? It's a furball. That's what it says. Look it up, Genesis. In the book of Genesis, that's what it says. It's a furball. That's my translation, but it's a furball. And they looked at it, and they're like, what are we going to call it? And they named him Esau. Well, why did they name him Esau? Because Esau means furball. It means a hairy garment. That's what it means. And that poor man had to live the rest of his life. Anywhere he went, yo, furball. Could you imagine, like, elementary school? I mean... Uh, later on, his uh, brother, you know, maybe like three minutes afterwards, decided to come out. And he was holding on to the heel of the furball. So what do they name that kid? Jacob. Well, what does Jacob mean? It means the heel grabber. Which actually means the deceitful one, the trickster, he, he, he's the cunning, he's the smoozer, he's, he's the... Hey, he's going to do whatever he can to get whatever he wants. He's a heel grabber. Well, that was the name they gave the kid. Guess what his character and nature was throughout his life? He was a deceiver. He was a trickster. He was a manipulator. He was a schmoozer. He, he, he was manipulating things to get what he wanted. That's who he was. They named him Jacob. Years go by, years go by, years go by. They're probably in their 20s. You had the big fur ball now. Who, by the way, if just, just as a side note, whose arms were apparently so hairy that when Jacob was trying to trick his father into believing that he was Esau, he put a goat skin on his arms. And so when Isaac would fill the arms of Jacob and felt the goat skin, he goes, oh, that must be Esau. He was a furball. Years go by, years go by, years go by. And God gets a hold of Jacob's life. Jacob wrestles with God for an entire night. And God looks at Jacob and says, I will no longer call you Jacob. Why? Well, because your name represented your character and your nature. And God says, I am no longer going to refer to you as the deceitful one. I'm no longer going to refer to you as the manipulator. You are no longer going to be known as the trickster. I'm now going to call you Israel. And Israel means the one who contends, the one who wrestles with God. Somewhere else, it means the prince of God. And so God looks at Jacob and says, I am no longer going to refer to you. I'm no longer going to see you and your nature and your character as this trickster, as this manipulator. I am now going to refer to you as my prince, as the one who is so intimate with me that, hey, we wrestle together. 
And the whole people from his line are not known as Jacobites. They're known as Israelites. The ones, the sons of God, the princes of God, the ones who are in relationship, the ones who contend with God. So when we're talking about the name of Jesus, we're not talking about, oh, that cute little thing you call him at the end of a prayer. Oh, that little thing that you, we mentioned in Sunday school. We're talk, when we talk about the name of Jesus, we're talking about his character. We're talking about his nature. We're talking about his attitude. We're talking about his heart. The very makeup of who he is is his name. Uh, one commentator said it this way. It shall never be eclipsed. His name shall never be eclipsed by any other name. Nor shall there be ever a name worthy to be coupled, which means to be compared. So there will never be a name worthy to be compared with his name. In human history, we find no name that can be fitly coupled with Christ's. Even in the world to come, it shall ever shine forth with an unapproached effulgence, which means brilliant and shining light. All this is said to exalt our sense of the divine power that so raised up and exalted the God-man, Jesus Christ, which is the same power, get this, that still works in us. But there is no name that is greater than Jesus's. His name is Far, far above. Uh, you may remember some stories in the Old Testament that, that uh, you had this group of pagans, and they're trying to beseech their gods on behalf of something. For example, you have the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And they come up to this little mountain, they're going to just have this big duel, this fight off. They both take a sacrifice. Bell people go first, they split their sacrifice, put it on the altar, and they begin to beseech their God, O oh, Bell, 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 come and send fire from heaven and light the sacrifice. And obviously nothing happens. Uh, Elijah gets up, dumps a whole bunch of water on top of this thing, says, hey God, show yourself as God. <laughs> this huge fire explosion happens. He kills the entire sacrifice, looks up all the water. Why is it that at the end of our prayers that we say, oh, in the name of Jesus, amen? See, we've, we've gotten so accustomed to that idea, it's almost like the add-on. Um, for example, maybe you never did this, but you know, you're praying as a little kid, and you don't say in the name of Jesus, amen, and you, you just say amen, and you go about your day, and you go, oh, I didn't say in the name of Jesus, it's not going to work. As if it's like the magic potion you put on the end of a prayer. Either that or we become so accustomed to it, we just, in the name of Jesus, amen. Just to hurry and get it done. But do you realize that when you are invoking the name of Jesus at the end of a prayer, what you're saying is, hey, according to your nature, according to all that you are, your makeup, your character, your attitude, your beating of your heart, I'm praying this and that in accordance with that attitude. That I'm not merely praying this out of my own selfish whims. I'm not merely praying this out of, oh, I really want a Corvette in the name of Jesus. <laughs> that is not according to his nature. That's selfishness. That would be sin. So when we're praying on accordance of, oh, in the name of Jesus, what we're saying is, hey, all that I've been praying for before is aligning with who you are. And who you are, I'm beseeching you as you are, to just look and say, will you move in this situation? Now listen to these verses from uh, John. Uh, John 14, 13 says, And whatever you ask in my name, according to my character, according to my nature, according to my makeup, who I am, that whatever you ask according to that, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Well, Nathan... I've been praying and praying and praying and praying. I know it's according to God's will, but it's not happening. Keep on praying. It's promised. If it's according to his nature, and God has placed it upon your heart, you can take it to the bank. And it may take years and years and years and years and years to see fulfilled, but it will happen. If it's a God prayer, he's praying it, he's birthing it in you, and it's according to his nature and his character. He can't say no. You can press back at me if you want later. 
Uh, John 14, 14. The next verse says, And if you ask anything of my name, according to my nature, my character, I will do it. But it has to be according to my nature, my character. 1 John 5, 14 says, Now this is the confidence. Hey, this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, his nature, his name, he hears us. <clears throat> so what does it mean to pray? Here, one commentator said this, I love it. He says, the name of Christ is the essence of his person. It is his nature, his preeminence, his majesty, his kingly rank, his all-encompassing authority, his holy, loving interests, his divine pleasures, his timeless commands, his perfect virtue, and his exemplary deeds. To pray or speak in the anima, which is the Greek word for the word name. So the name of Christ, the anima of Christ. To pray or speak in his name is to do a thing by his command, fortified in all-compassing authority, exerting his kingly rank, his holy loving interest, his divine pleasure, his timeless command, acting on his behalf and promoting his cause in this earth. That is what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. So when we're praying, we're not just saying, oh, in the name of Jesus, amen. We're saying, hey, I am praying according to the divine nature of who you are, and all that you are I am beseeching on my behalf. And I am praying with this idea that the very thing that I am praying for is the very heartbeat of you. Amen. So if that makes sense to you, I want to take, take it up one more level. You realize that the name of Jesus is above all other names. But we as Christians are the very bearers of his name. We are name bearers. In fact, Christian means little Christ. Christ in. That his name and his nature is the very thing within our lives. That we bear his name. For example, you have this cute young couple, they're getting married. And the bride looks at the groom. And says, you know what? I love you. At least I hope that's what they're saying. I love you. You know what? I, I love you so much that all that I am, I'm going to toss aside. I'm going to give up my selfishness. I'm going to give up my rights. In fact, I'm going to give up my entire identity. Hey, I will even give up my name to take on yours. And all that you are, your character, your nature, your attitude is now going to become mine. And I'm going to take upon myself your name. And we as Christians are the bride of Christ. We are the ones who take upon the name of Jesus. We are the ones who look at our groom and say, Oh, I love you. I will give up everything to have your nature. In fact, I will give up my identity to have your nature. In fact, you can take my name so I can have yours. And he bestows upon us his name, which does not mean merely we take on his name, but also his character, his nature, his attitude, his heart, his mind, his... We are bearing his name. Now, Isaiah 62.5 says, And the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Our God rejoices rejoices over us as a groom looks at his bride and rejoices over a bride second corinthians 11 2 for i am jealous for you with godly jealousy for i have betrothed you to one husband that i may present you as a chaste virgin of christ we are his bride ephesians 5 31 for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh this is a great mystery, Paul says, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. That the whole illustration of marriage is to be a picture of our relationship with Christ. Because we're taking on his name. 
Uh, Song of Solomon 1.3. I love this passage. Oh, so good. Because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is ointment poured forth, and therefore the virgins love you. Do you realize that our groom has this ointment, this fragrance, and he so passionately loves his bride that he is pouring his name out upon us. And we not merely have his name, but it's literally, there's this deposit of the essence of who he is within us. He has literally put within us the essence of his nature. Christ in you. We are his bride. If this was true, would we not look at every single situation, every single problem, every single good thing, and say, I bear the name of Jesus, which means I have his attitude, I have his nature, I have his character, I have his flow, I have his love beating inside my life. It also means that because his name is far above and all things are underneath his feet, and he's inside of me, then all things are beneath my feet. And nothing can touch me. Would we not walk around with a triumph, with a joy, with an excitement, with this passion? In fact, Paul says this in Romans chapter 8. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Hey, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, can that stuff even separate us? No, Paul says. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. We're not just conquerors. We are more than conquerors. We are far above tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. We are far above it. Because Christ lives in us. Yet on all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So here's what we're going to do. I'm very excited. <clears throat> we are going to worship. Uh, but we're not just going to worship. Uh, we're going to do something a little unprecedented, probably. When there's ladders in the sanctuary, everything's a little unprecedented. <clears throat> I don't want you to write. Uh, I want you to meditate, which is not a bad, scary word. I don't mean like new agey. That's not what we're talking about. <clears throat> I want you to contemplate the essence of Jesus' name. If you want one in the back, uh, we have printed out what you're going to see. So don't like be going, oh, I'm not going to be able to write it down. You're not going to be able to write it down, I promise you. Uh, so in the back, there is all the names with biblical references to them. Okay? So take a deep breath. Um, they'll also be online this week, so if you want to go to the website and download them, that's where they are too. But we're going to have a time of worship. And we're literally going to walk through some of the names of Christ presented in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. All throughout Scripture, we're pre it's presenting Jesus as, oh, He is God. And as we're walking through this, keep in mind, when we're talking about the names of Jesus, we're not talking about, oh, all these cute little fluffy Sunday school names. We're talking about his nature, his character, his attitude, his very makeup. <coughs> so I want to worship this morning. And I want to give you permission to worship. Which means if you want to stay seated, stay seated. If you want to stand up, stand up. If you want to come to the altars, come to the altars. If you want to get on your face, sit on your face. If you want to do the hokey pokey in the back, I'll give you permission. But I want you to see the names of Jesus in a whole new light. Because the very essence of his name is who he is. And it's deposited within us. So this is who Jesus is. Song of Solomon 1.3 says, Your name 
is ointment poured forth. And therefore will I love you. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. Those who know your character and your attitude and your nature have no problem putting their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. Oh, my precious Jesus, we worship thee as heavenly royalty. We love in thee no mere man, but the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Thou art of nature God, his son, his being. Though you've walked this dusty earth in the form of man, you never once surrendered your deity. Your name is above every, every, every name. For thou art a son given, the son of the living God, the only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, the firstborn of every creature, the son of the highest, the son of the blessed, the mighty God, the everlasting God, the true God, God my Savior, over all God blessed forever, the God of the whole earth, God manifest in the flesh, the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, and thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Thou art the Almighty, which is and which was and which is to come, the creator of all things, the upholder of all things, the Father of eternity, the beginning and the ending, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. You are the life, that eternal life which was with the Father. You are that lives. You are the Word, the Word that was with God, the Word that was God. Thou art the Word of God, the Word of life, the Word that was made flesh, the image of God, the image of the invisible God, the express image of His person, the brightness of His glory. You are a child born, the sin to the Father, the prophet of Nazareth, a prophet mighty in deed and word. You are a servant, the Nazarene, the carpenter, a stranger and an alien, a man of sorrows, a worm and no man, even the accursed of God, who humbled yourself unto death, even death upon a cross. You are Jesus, the Savior of the world, the Savior which is Christ the Lord, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ himself, Jesus the Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord, Jesus Christ the righteous, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, Jesus of Nazareth, Lord Jesus, Messiah, anointed, the Christ of God. You are the Lamb of God, a Lamb without blemish and without spot, the Lamb that was slain, the Lamb in the midst of the throne, you are the way, the door of the sheep, the shepherd of the sheep, the good shepherd that laid down his life, the great shepherd that was brought again from the dead, the chief shepherd that shall again appear. You are the vine, the tree of life, the corn of wheat, the bread of God, the bread of life, the hidden manna, a plant of renown, the light, the true light, a great light, the light of the world, the light of men, a light of the Gentiles, a star, the bright and morning star, the day star, the day spring from on high, the sun of righteousness. You are the strength of the children of Israel, a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in distress, a refuge from the storm, a covert from the tempest, the hope of thy people, a horn of salvation. You are the rock, my strong rock, the rock of ages, the rock that is higher than I, my rock and my fortress, the rock of my strength, the rock of my refuge, a rock of habitation, the rock of my heart, the rock of my salvation, my rock and my redeemer, that spiritual rock and a shadow from the heat. Thou art the builder, the foundation, a sure foundation, a stone, a living stone, a tried stone, a chief cornerstone, and a precious stone. 
Thou art the minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, the minister of the circumcision, and thy flesh is the veil which was rent in two. Thou art the temple, a sanctuary, the altar, the offerer, the offering, the sacrifice, and thy life is a ransom, and thou art the lamb slain. You are the forerunner, for us entered even Jesus, the mercy seat, the priest, the high priest, the great high priest, the mediator, the daysman, the interpreter, the intercessor, the advocate, the surety, the gift of God, his unspeakable gift, the chosen of God, the salvation of God, the redeemer, the Shiloh, the peacemaker, the most blessed forever. Thou art the one of whom the Father says, my blessed, in whom my soul is well pleased, mine elect, in whom my soul delights. You are the faithful and true, the truth, a covenant of the people, the covenanter, the faithful and true witness, a witness to the people, and you are the amen. You are the Holy One and just, the Holy One of Israel, the Holy One of God, and you are holy, holy, holy. You are the beginning of the creation of God, the firstborn from the dead, the first begotten of the dead, the firstborn among the brethren, the first fruits of many that sleep, the last Adam, the resurrection, a quickening spirit, the head of the body of the church, the head over all things to the church, the head of every man, the head of all principality and power, the captain of the host of the Lord, the captain of salvation, the author and finisher of faith. You are the leader, a commander, a ruler, a governor, the deliverer, the lion of the tribe of Judah, an ensign of the people, the chiefest among 10,000. You are a polished shaft and you are my shield. You are the Lord of Lords, Lord both of the dead and of the living, Lord of the Sabbath, you are the Lord of peace, the Lord of all, and the Lord over all. The Messiah, the Prince, the Prince of life, a Prince and a Savior, the Prince of peace, the Prince of princes, the Prince of the kings of the earth, the glory of all thy people Israel, he that fills all in all. You are the King of kings, you are the judge, the righteous judge, a scepter out of all of Israel, David their king, king of the daughter of Zion, born as the king of the Jews, crucified as the king of the Jews, the king of saints, king of nations, and king over all the earth. You are the king of righteousness. You are the king of peace, the king of glory, the king in all his beauty. You are crowned with a crown of thorns. You are crowned with glory and honor. You are crowned with a crown of pure gold, crowned with many crowns, and thou sitteth king forever. You are a king and priest after the order of Melchizedek, the one likened unto Moses, a refiner's fire and the fuller's soap. You are the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds. Thou art as rain upon the morn grass, as showers that water the earth, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. You are a hiding place from the wind. Thou art as ointment poured forth fairer than the children of men. You are a crown of glory and beauty, a stone of grace, a nail fastened in a sure place, a brother born for adversary, a friend that sticks closer than a brother, a friend that loves at all times. Your countenance is as the sun, and your countenance as Lebanon. Yea, though art altogether lovely, you are my beloved and my friend. You are the bridegroom the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the bundle of myrrh, a cluster of henna blooms. Oh, and you are obedient, meek, lowly, guileless, tempted, oppressed, despised, rejected, betrayed, condemned, reviled, scourged, mocked, wounded, bruised, stricken, smitten, crucified, and forsaken. You are merciful, faithful, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate, perfect, glorious, mighty, justified, exalted, risen, and glorified. You are my portion, my maker, my husband, 
my well-beloved, my Savior, my hope, my brother, my helper, my physician, my healer, my refiner, my purifier, my Lord and Master, my servant, my example, my teacher, my shepherd, my keeper, my feeder, my leader, my restorer, my resting place, my meat and my drink, my Passover, my peace, my wisdom, my righteousness, my sanctification, and my redemption. You are my Jesus. You are my all in all. 